Hello everyone, DM Gashbad here, and I am continuing to experiment with solo gaming because I am practicing social distancing, and honestly, I'm an introvert, and this is working out okay for me right now. But today we have a brand new system. I am trying Marvel Crisis Protocol. Now they have these special ultimate encounter scenarios where two teams of superheroes try to fight a big bad. And for the first one that they created, the one against Ultron, the all will be metal scenario, they created solo play rules for it. So you make two teams of superheroes and you fight against Ultron, which is controlled by an AI flow sheet. So a little background with me and Marvel Crisis Protocol. Now, I was asked early on before the game was released, hey, are you excited about Marvel Crisis Protocol? Because normally you would think I would be. I am a really big Marvel fan. I read the X-Men comics for a long time. I really enjoy the movies. And of course, I'm a war gamer. The thing is, I really, really liked Night Model's Marvel Universe miniature game. I really liked that game. I couldn't really get anyone interested in it, though. And then, of course, Night Models just suddenly stopped production of the whole thing. So it was a little bit disappointing. I still love it. I still may play it on this channel, but it all depends on opponents. I wish they came out with a solo play scenario, but of course, that's not going to happen. So Marvel Crisis Protocol comes out, and it's kind of a once-bitten type of scenario. I already found a game that I liked. It was hard to imagine jumping into a new similar game, especially because it came in a slightly different scale. If it had come out and it was the exact same scale, fine, no problem. The issue is, is that the Marvel Crisis Protocol miniatures are just a little bit larger. Now, I went and I painted an Ultron, and it's not that bad. The miniatures go pretty quickly. I don't think I would have a problem painting up a full team of Marvel Crisis Protocol miniatures. The issue is the terrain. I spent a lot of time making a nice set of terrain features and boards for both the Marvel Universe miniature game and the Batman miniature game. I really didn't want to go and do that again, only slightly larger. I just had no enthusiasm for it. I did get the core box. I am curious about the game. I watched a lot of videos on it. I do want to try it, especially since they have this solo scenario that I can try without looking like an idiot in front of other people. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use proxy models. I normally don't do that kind of thing, but they're the exact same characters. I've already painted them. I'm going to use my Marvel Universe miniature game models in this Crisis Protocol game. There is a lot of overlap from these two model ranges. Five of the starter box models already have Marvel Universe miniature game counterparts, and so I bought a couple of the booster packs to sort of fill out my collection, Hulk, Venom, Black Panther, that kind of thing. So I'm not doing this because I'm cheap. I'm doing it because I'm lazy. I don't want to make a new table full of terrain. I do understand that there is one small problem with the miniatures in that their bases are slightly smaller and that does affect how far that they can move because of the way Marvel Crisis Protocol uses the little range rulers and you start at one end of the base and you move them over so people with larger bases will move further. My theory is that it's not going to matter a whole lot. I mean, what, at most it's probably going to shave half an inch off of a character's movement. I have seen some battle reports where small amounts of movement do matter, but I'm going to try it anyway. I don't think it's going to be that big of an issue. So here we go. Here is Ultron, all freshly painted up my one actual Marvel Crisis Protocol miniature that I am using. He is a super-powered version with an AI flow sheet to dictate what he is going to do in the course of a turn, and my job is to defeat that guy. To fight him, I get two teams of up to 15 threat. My first team is an Avengers affiliation. I brought Captain America, the Incredible Hulk, Black Widow, and the Invincible Iron Man. Quick note here, I actually had to restart this game twice. The first time I messed up the deployments of the mission objectives, and I felt, well, that's, that, that's not how it's supposed to work, so I'm going to redo it. The second time, I misplayed a rule about how you pick up civilians. So this is actually the third time, and for this third time, I rearranged my Avengers team a little bit. I put Black Widow and Hulk in there. Originally, I had Spider-Man and Black Panther. I just thought that the Hulk's superpowers, because he uses them so frequently, especially that Gamma Leap, he really benefited from Captain America's affiliation uh, advantage. I am running this game on normal difficulty because I do not know what I am doing, and I think anything harder would be really tough. At normal difficulty, I get three of those team-up cards, those team tactic cards. I chose Gamma Launch, so Hulk can throw somebody. Avengers Assemble to get a little extra movement and recalibration matrix in case I really have a bad roll go against me. And I think I might have a chance of redoing it. I really don't know anything about these team tactics cards. I don't really know which ones are good, which ones work with what characters or anything like that. So I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. 
I did go through them. These are the ones that stood out as ones that looked like they might be useful. That's what I took. For my second team, we get an unaffiliated team because there is no Marvel Universe miniature game Red Skull, and I haven't bought the characters from the other packs. So we've got kind of a Spider-Man and his friends and foes. We have Venom and Dr. Octopus, as well as the amazing Spider-Man and Black Panther. Why these characters? Because that's what I had. If I bought some of the other Marvel Crisis Protocol packs, maybe I could have brought in some of the Guardians of the Galaxy, some of the Asgardians, but I didn't, and so I didn't. Their team tactics cards are Sacrifice, Mission Objective, and Brace for Impact. So here's the table all set up, all the markers are down, all the characters have been deployed. I tried to follow the Marvel Crisis Protocol's rules of doing only about 12 terrain pieces and keeping the sizes mostly between the 2 and 4 range. Here is an unexpected thing about the scale that I'm using though. When I put that on the board, it looked just empty. The table looked really weird. It still looks pretty empty compared to the Marvel Universe miniature games and the Batman games that I play. I think the idea is, is that Marvel Crisis Protocol expects you to use those pre-printed mats where there's a bunch of streets that you're not going to put any scenery elements on, and also the terrain is going to be larger. So the Marvel Universe miniature train that I am using is going to take up a lot less space and therefore make the table looks empty. And also because I don't generally prefer those street mats, just a personal thing I have. Anyway, we've got the home base in the center of the table. So my job, or one of my jobs, is to get terrified civilians from the terrain pieces that they're hiding in and get them to the home base. The home base is being represented by a small sewer cover in the very center. There are four doomsday consoles in the center of the table as well. You can see three of them. One is behind that half-constructed building. Anyway, control those can flip back and forth, and if Ultron controls all four of them, then he automatically wins the game. Otherwise, they score you victory points at the end of every round. Size-wise, I've got a couple of barrels, and there's like a little propane tank, and a crate scattered around. Those are size one. They really don't matter at all. They don't obstruct movement. It's not worth throwing them. They will stop throws, so if you're tossing someone else and they run into one of those things, they'll get stopped and they'll get destroyed. Otherwise, size one pieces hardly matter. So I did put more of those down on the table than the rules strictly say that I should. For size two, we have a taxi, a cop car, and two dumpsters. For size 3, we have an ambulance and a food truck. For size 4, I've got those shipping containers. And size 5 are the two buildings. So I set up this terrain before I really knew what I was doing as far as the scenario goes. And it turns out that I did myself a couple of favors. Large terrain pieces like the buildings and the shipping containers are really good for finding terrified civilians that you can bring to the safe area in the center of the table. Also, the closer these scenery elements are to the center of the table, the more useful it is. So I've got a couple of nice big pieces clustered within a reasonable range of that central point. So I think you can make it a lot harder on yourself if the bigger elements are tucked way in the corners or if they're spread out away from the center or something like that. The ambulance in particular is really nice because I can have a character within range of that. They can find a terrified civilian and immediately deposit them into the home zone without ever moving. As far as deployment goes, there's no actual rules as to where to put Ultron, so I just put him in the dead center of his deployment zone, moved up as far forward as possible. I didn't really know what I was doing with my superheroes, so I just kind of did the most straightforward thing I could think of, which is take the slowest characters and put them in the middle. That would be Venom and Hulk. Also, Captain America, he's not exceptionally fast, and he's got that bodyguard ability, and a bunch of videos I've watched really shows Hulk take a whole ton of damage, and I keep thinking, why isn't Captain America around there to keep him alive a while? So I'll, that's my concept there. Iron Man is just a little bit away from Captain America, still somewhat central, and then Black Widow and Black Panther are both out on the wings with that long movement of theirs. Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus also have reasonable movements, and so I put them up on the building there because they both have wall crawler and it's not going to cause any problems to them. So here's the way this is going to work. I'm going to get an activation. My heroes are going to get an activation, and I get to choose three characters to activate, and we all get a turn. Then Ultron is going to get one of his activation. We follow what it does, says to do on his cards, and then I get to choose three more guys to activate, and then Ultron gets another turn, and then I get three more guys, or in my case two, because I've got a total of eight models on the table, and then Ultron gets a final round. And then that is the end of the turn. My team gets points for rescuing terrified civilians and controlling the Doomsday consoles. We also immediately win if we manage to destroy Ultron five times. Every time we take away all his health, and he's got like 8 health, he gets a new robot body, he appears somewhere else, he gets a corrupted firmware token which affects one of his attacks, two of his attacks. 
And if he ever collects five of those, then we win. We've beaten up Ultron. I think it's really, really unlikely that we're going to be able to do that. So my focus is going to be on getting victory points by controlling Doomsday consoles and rescuing civilians. Ultron gets points for taking out my characters, controlling Doomsday consoles, and destroying terrified civilians. He also immediately wins if he controls all four Doomsday consoles. He's just activated the device and he's destroyed the city. So, game start round one, we start with my heroes. I'm going to immediately start with Captain America. Captain America is pretty tough. He can take a bunch of damage, and so I'm not really worried about him getting out into the center of the table. Plus, that's what Captain America do, would do, right? In fact, the first thing that he would do is protect the most helpless of all citizens, those in the ambulance. So, he's got two actions. He makes a move, then he makes another move, both of them medium. He ends up right there. So, he is within one, the little range ruler one, of both the ambulance and the home base. So, I'm going to search the ambulance for one power. I've generated one power for everyone except Hulk who gets three and I roll a number of dice equal to the size of the terrain feature in this case it's size three so I roll three dice if I get any crits or wilds I immediately pick up a terrified civilian that was the mistake I made in the second run through of this is I thought the terrified civilian just shows up and I have to pick him up separately which made things a lot a lot harder but he just gets him Unfortunately, Captain America searches the ambulance and doesn't find anybody, so no immediate victory points for my guys. For my second action, I am going to go with the Incredible Hulk, who also is in a good position. He's standing right next to that size 5 building, so I'm going to take 5 dice and I'm going to use one of his 3 power to search for a civilian. And he manages to get one, so he immediately picks up some scared person, probably on the second floor, and he moves his short move towards the home base. His short move is actually pretty long. I think the Marvel Universe miniature game Hulk, his base is pretty close to the actual Crisis Protocol Hulk's base, so he actually goes a fair way. You can only make a single move action if you're holding a terrified civilian, but Hulk has a superpower called Gamma Leap, which is not a move action, you just get placed within two of your starting position, and because he is on Captain America's team, each superpower is reduced in cost by one, so he can spend his remaining two power, hop over, there's the manhole cover, tosses the terrified civilian down the hole, and we've scored ourselves a victory point. So next I'm going with the Amazing Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider-Man takes two move actions off of that huge building. He goes all the way to the Doomsday console opposite him on the opposite side of the table. So I could have flipped that Doomsday console with the one power that Spider-Man has, but instead I'm going to search the shipping container and try and pick up a civilian. That of course does cost one power, but I do get one. The shipping containers are size four, so I roll four dice and I get a crit or a wild, and so Spider-Man rescues someone who's hiding in there. So the reason I'm doing this is because of the way Ultron acts, and I might as well get into this now because I have activated three of my characters, and so now it's Ultron's turn. So in the beginning of each of Ultron's turns, you roll a number of dice equal to the difficulty. So uh, with normal difficulty, I roll three dice at the beginning of every round, plus one for every Doomsday console he controls. And the symbols that those dice come up with represent things that these doomsday consoles are actually doing. Because the machines aren't just there to be flipped on and off, they're actually actively wrecking the city as we go. So with my three dice, I get two results. Secondary power reserves and devastating barrage, which means I rolled some combination of blanks, skulls, and a crit. The secondary power reserve comes first. First off, Ultron just scores a victory point, just right off the top. Then if he doesn't control any doomsday consoles, which right now he doesn't, he is going to control one. So we've chosen the one furthest away from him, which is that one over by the shipping containers in the upper left where Black Widow and Black Panther are. This is why I didn't want to flip a console in my first activation because I thought it was just really likely that Ultron would just flip it right back because his AI functioning says that he will prioritize gaining control of ones that you have gone and controlled. Which just makes sense. So Devastating Barrage goes and it causes one damage to up to three characters that are within range three of the central home base. Right now there are only two characters within three and so both the Incredible Hulk and Captain America take one damage and get one power. So now we go on to the next part of Ultron's turn which is his actual actions. The first thing he looks for is if there's a character within range 5 that is holding a terrified civilian. And in this case it is Spider-Man. So he is going to advance towards him and that will be his first action. If there's no character within range 5 holding a terrified civilian, then he'll look for a terrified civilian within range 5 and go towards that guy. 
If there's none of them, then he will advance towards a doomsday console that he doesn't control that is not within range five, and then he'll use his matter transference ability to get within one. This is a really confusing section of the rules. So if he's nearby a doomsday console that he doesn't control, he won't go to that. He will go to a far one. Most of the time, this means that he won't reach it if he uses his normal advance of medium plus his matter transference of range two. But the rules don't exactly say he makes a medium advance and then uses his matter transference to go an additional range two. It says he makes an advance move and then he uses matter transference to get within one of the doomsday console. So my reading of it, the one that makes the most sense to me, is that the range two doesn't matter in this particular case. He just sort of teleports himself across the battlefield to the furthest doomsday console that he doesn't control. If you run it the other way, so long as you aren't holding any terrified civilians, no terrified civilians are wandering around the table, then Ultron seems to just kind of like mindlessly stumble from one doomsday console to another, not accomplishing a whole lot. If you do it this way, then he's constantly warping from doomsday console to doomsday console, unless you're holding terrified civilians, flipping them to his control and just going from one end of the battlefield to the other. And he's really annoying. So I feel like that's the better way of doing things. It incentivizes the heroes to actually go and find civilians and generally just makes Ultron more obnoxious and more productive in his rounds. So this is why I wanted Spider-Man to be holding a terrified civilian because I wanted to draw Ultron away from the Doomsday Consoles. I don't need him generating victory points at the end of the round. I don't need him generating extra dice during his turns. So instead, Ultron just makes a normal move over to Spider-Man. He can fly, so he ends up on that shipping container. And then he's got a character within range two, so he's going to use his metallic talons attack with the Folly of Man upgrade. Ugh. Side note, this game took me forever. There are a lot of rules interactions. There are a lot of things that you have to go through for, like every character, but especially Ultron. So just bear with me. So Ultron has a six power attack, which counts blanks as hits going into Spider-Man with his defense of three with the ability to reroll one. And Ultron immediately goes and rolls hot garbage. Spider-Man takes absolutely no damage. Ultron would also inflict the bleed effect if he got a wild. He doesn't get a wild on any of the dice. Ultron also gets a pierce on a wild as well, but of course he doesn't do that either. So that was a little unexpected. Spider-Man does have to survive two more activations of Ultron, but still can't complain. So it's back to my turn. I get three more characters to activate. The score is currently tied one because Hulk deposited a terrified civilian versus one because Ultron got that secondary power reserve, which is grants him a victory point. So moving on and I'm going to activate Black Panther, which for some reason I did not take a picture of. But anyway, he's just going to take two move actions. He's got a long move, so he's got lots of range. So he goes to the far doomsday console next to the under construction building and he flips it to our control. Next, I'm going to activate the Invincible Iron Man. Iron Man is going to move forward. He's going to get next to that Doomsday console. We're going to flip it to our control as well. It used to be under Ultron's control. Now it's ours. And he's going to take another move action. He's going to fly over to the other side of that shipping container. Maybe when I get some more power, I'll be able to search that and then fly them directly to the home base. Finally, I'm going to activate Venom. Venom is going to take two move actions to get through past the big building and the ambulance. Venom is size 3, the same as the ambulance, so he can hop over it with no penalty. So he gets over to that near Doomsday console and also flips it to our control. So we've now got control of three of these things. So we're back to Ultron's activation, his second of this turn. For his Doomsday dice, again, he is rolling three of those. He gets a blank or a skull for secondary power, so he goes up another victory point, and he flips one of our consoles to his control. He's going to re-control the one that he had flipped before, the one that Iron Man flipped back to us. So that's just flipping back and forth right now. He also rolls a shield result, which would be one path to peace. So if there are any terrified civilians running around the table, they would all get removed and Ultron would score one victory point for each one of them that he removes. There's none of those on the table right now, so nothing happens. Finally, he gets a hit result, which is the horrifying scraping sound. So Spider-Man is completely unnerved by whatever noises Ultron is making and he drops his terrified civilian. So now we go on to Ultron's AI flowchart, and there are no characters holding terrified civilians within five of him, but now there is a terrified civilian, so he's going to advance to within one of that. 
the hero team gets to decide where those terrified civilian tokens are dropped when they get to drop them. So I put them as far back as possible. It doesn't matter. Ultron can still easily with advance medium and get to within one of that. And if he ever ends an activation or a move within one of the terrified civilian tokens, then he just gets rid of it and scores himself a victory point. Sorry, person. Spider-Man tried to rescue you, but then, you know, Ultron turned up his speakers and it made a really loud noise and he just dropped you. You wiggled free. And that was all she wrote. So now we go to Ultron's attack function, and here we end up with another weird situation. So, if there's one character within range 2, then he's going to do his metallic talents. Well, right now there's actually two characters within 2. There is Spider-Man and Venom. So then we go to the next thing, and is there more than one character within his Rage of Ultron attack? Well, right now his Rage of Ultron attack is only range 1, and no, there isn't. So he actually goes on to say, well, is there anyone within range four? And well, yes, there is. So he's actually going to do an energy blast. So we skip over the metallic talons, even though he's within range two of somebody. So he's going to do an energy blast and he's going to target people who are holding terrified civilians. There aren't any. Next, we look for people who are injured. Again, there's no one within four that's injured. So then we look for the lowest energy defense, which in this case would be Venom. So Ultron uses his power seven energy blast onto Venom. Venom. He rolls a little worse than I would have expected. He only causes three damage to Venom, which of course gives Venom three power. So Venom goes and uses so many snacks as a reaction using that power that he just gained. Now he doesn't have the enough power to go and use the one where he can attack Ultron and get health back, but he can use the symbiote tendrils. So those lash out at Ultron and causes one point of damage. So that's it for Ultron's second activation. We go on to my final group of heroes, or hero-like individuals, in this case, Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus decides that the spider people can go and tangle with Ultron right now. He's got other things to do. He's going to make a double medium move. So both of his actions are move actions. He's going to get to within one of that shipping container, and he's going to search that for his one power. So we roll four dice looking for crits and wilds, but we don't get any, so we can't find any civilians in there. Finally, we activate Black Widow. Black Widow moves over to that Doomsday console that has been flipped back and forth several times, and she's going to flip it to our side once again. She's going to make another move, much less than her normal long move. She's going to hang out by that shipping container over there, ready to search it in her next round, and try and rescue some more civvies. So it is Ultron's turn again, and so we roll our three dice, because again, he is not controlling any Doomsday consoles. Thankfully, we don't get any secondary power reserves, so he doesn't get any free victory points, and also doesn't flip control of any of the Doomsday consoles, which would be exactly the same thing, because this is the last activation of the round, so any Doomsday consoles that he controls, he's immediately going to score a victory point from. Instead, he gets one path to peace, which will take care of any civilians running around the table that aren't being protected by my guys. Well, there aren't any, so that doesn't matter. And we get a devastating barrage. So, now there are more characters within three of that home base. We've got Iron Man, Hulk, and Captain America. All three of those guys take a point of damage and get one power. Unfortunately, none of my guys are holding civilians right now, so we are going to go to Ultron's third step in his ladder, which is move towards a Doomsday console that is not within range 5, that is not controlled by him, and then use matter transference to get within 1. So again, I'm ruling that the matter transference just gets him within 1 instead of moving his 2. If it didn't, then he'd just sort of end up somewhere in the middle of the table not accomplishing anything. Instead, he warps to the other side of the table, back to that Doomsday console that's just been flipped back and forth this whole game. He finally goes and flips it to his control, and he's standing right next to it thinking that that has decided the matter. So again, we've got more than one character within range 2 of Ultron, but not more than one within range of his Rage of Ultron attack, so we go over to the Energy Blast. He's got a wealth of targets around him, but the one with the lowest energy defense is the Incredible Hulk. So he fires a 7 power energy blast at the Hulk, who only has 2 energy defense, and somehow only manages to hit him for 1 damage, which is kind of shocking. One thing about these 8-sided dice, they are just really swingy. Sometimes you'll roll off these even dice and it'll be like, oh well, someone just took 5 damage, and sometimes it'll just be these insurmountable odds, and so three rounds in a row, Ultron has not really accomplished much of anything with his attacks. It is the end of the round, though. Ultron is going to score one victory point for controlling one of the consoles, and my guys are going to score two victory points for controlling two of the consoles. That brings the current victory point standings at three to four, Ultron's favor. 
So we've got a new turn and I've got three new heroes that can activate. So I'm gonna start off with Captain America because he is well positioned. He's also got some power to spend because he's taken a couple devastating barrages. He's going to search that ambulance for one power, but again, come up with no crits or wild so he doesn't find anyone in the ambulance. Man, Captain America is gonna do a real thorough job there. That's real disappointing because it would have been nice to just get an instant rescue. So then Captain America makes a medium move action followed by a short climb action so he can clamber over that shipping container. Then with one of his power he's going to flip that console back to our control and then for his last power he's going to search that shipping container right there and this time he is going to roll four dice to f try and find a civilian but again he doesn't come up with anything. Man, Captain America is probably the worst at hide and go seek so he... He searched two fairly large terrain pieces in this round and didn't find a single civilian. So next I'm going to activate the Incredible Hulk and I'm going to do something that I probably shouldn't have done. I said I wasn't going to try and put damage on Ultron, but Hulk has taken some damage which means that some of his powers go up and it's kind of burning a hole in my pockets. Plus he's added a lot of power from the damage that he's taken already. So Hulk is going to spend two power to Gamma Leap over to Ultron. Would normally be three, but Captain America reduces the cost by one. He's then going to do a strike onto Ultron. Costs no power, but does take an action. It would normally have a strength of six, but it goes up by one because Hulk has taken some damage. That's going up against Ultron's physical defense of five. When all is said and done, Hulk causes no damage, so Ultron isn't the only one who can roll badly. That's okay, we have another action to do. Hulk is going to fire a second strike, and this time we are more successful. We cause three damage to Ultron this time, but... Later on, I make a mistake, and so I actually downgrade it to two. The thing is that I didn't realize at the time is that Ultron has a special ability called Enough, where if he takes three damage in a round, he's going to throw the character that did it. And I don't realize this for a couple activations later. And that would have changed a bunch of stuff that came later, and I didn't know how it would have affected, because there's this whole mechanism of determining how Ultron cha uh, throws people, and I didn't want to do it, and so what I just did instead, just to keep it simple and relatively honest, is instead of doing three damage, I said Hulk only did two damage. So if the counters that you're looking at in the picture don't quite add up to what I'm telling you, that's the reason why. Finally, I got some power to play with, so we're going to do Hulk Smash. And again, I don't roll really well. I only cause one point of damage, but I do get a throw to go with that. Now, there's nowhere really to throw him because he's just surrounded by people and he's going to bump into something. So I ended up just kind of pushing him back a little bit into that shipping container. So Ultron's going to take another point of damage from that. All in all, it probably would have been a lot better if Hulk had gone and tried to rescue a civilian. But what can you do? He's an angry guy. For my third activation this round, I am going to go with Black Widow. Black Widow is going to search the shipping container next to her, and she's going to actually get a civilian. Can't hide from Black Widow. I am within strike range of Ultron, so I'm going to go and do a basic strike against that guy, see if I can't pick a little bit more damage onto him. Unfortunately, Black Widow doesn't cause any more damage, so she just makes that long move and goes and pops the civilian down into the underground, netting ourselves another victory point. So it's Ultron's turn again, and we roll his three dice for the Doomsday Consoles, and we get three different results. One is one path to peace, which means that he would destroy any terrified civilians on the table. There aren't any, so we just move on. Then we get horrifying scraping sounds. So if anyone was holding a civilian at the time, they would drop it. Now, no one is holding a civilian because that happens. If no one's holding a civilian, Ultron has the time to launch a devastating barrage. There are three characters within three of that home base, so Hulk, Captain America, and Black Widow all take one point of damage and gain one power. Finally, Ultron rolls a Wild, which is a better age. That is going to destroy one of the terrain pieces, and he's going to prioritize terrain pieces that are closest to the home base, so the ambulance goes away, which was really kind of nice, but we couldn't find anyone in there. Um, we didn't look hard enough, though, because when a terrain piece is destroyed, we actually place a terrified civilian token on the table. Now, me as the hero player, I get to place that wherever I like, so I push it over towards Venom, but still within range 5 of Ultron. So that means that when Ultron goes and moves, which he's going to do right now, he is going to advance towards the civilian, but not be within range to actually attack it. Instead, because he is in within range 2 of only one of my characters, he is going to use his Metallic Talons plus Folly of Man attack on Iron Man. Makes sense, Ultron doesn't care for Iron Man. Anyway, he is again going to roll like junk. 
He doesn't get any wild, so no pierce, no bleed, and he's only going to cause one damage. Well, it would be two damage, but he's the Invincible Iron Man, and he reduces all damage incoming into him by one to a minimum of one. So again, not too bad. So I get another three characters to activate, and I'm going to start with Venom. That terrified civilian happens to be within one of the lethal protector Venom, and so he is just going to pick that guy up for one power. I can't move twice while I'm holding a civilian, so instead we're going to use the symbiote tendrils on Ultron. We're going to do one point of damage to him, so Ultron's getting pretty hurt here now. And then instead of going towards home base, I'm actually just going to move away. I'm going to try and kite Ultron off to an unused section of the battlefield. Part of it is because I don't want him messing with people like Black Panther or Black Widow who are going to be hopefully doing a lot of civilian shuffling in rounds to come. Second off, I just don't want him clustered up near a bunch of my guys because that Rage of Ultron is nine dice. So I really don't want him ending up within range one of more than one of my guys. Next, we're going to activate Black Panther. Black Panther searches the big under construction building and finds a civilian. He's going to take a long move over to the home base, deposit that guy. So we've saved another innocent human and we've got ourselves a victory point. Finally, the rules say while holding a terrified civilian, I can't make a second move action. Well, I made a move action and now I'm not holding a terrified civilian token. So my understanding of this is that I can now make a second move action. So Black Panther just runs back to almost exactly where he was before, guarding that Doomsday console and also being right next to that giant building to hopefully do this again next round. Finally, Spider-Man's going to do the exact same thing. He's going to spend a power, he's going to search that shipping container near him, he's going to find a civilian, move it over to that home base with his long movement, and then he's going to move directly back. So now I just picked up a couple nice victory points and I'm feeling like I may have figured out the scenario, so I'm getting a little cocky. So now it's Ultron's second activation and he rolls for his Doomsday Dice. He's going to roll three of them again. He's going to get secondary power reserves, which again gives him another victory point. And also flips control of the Doomsday Console. Now I'm going with the one next to Black Panther. He also rolls up one path to peace, which doesn't do anything. And then finally he gets off another devastating barrage, which is going to cause another point of damage to Black Widow, Hulk, and Iron Man. These devastating barrages are really starting to weaken Iron Man and Black Widow. Hulk, of course, loves it. More damage, more power. He's all for it. So going back to the AI flowchart, we are going to advance medium towards a character who is holding a terrified civilian, and that is Eddie Brock Venom. So now in the assault function, we only have one character within range two, so he's going to use metallic talons plus folly of man on Eddie Brock, and this time Ultron gets his dice together and hands Venom a massive six damage. So Venom is now dazed. He drops the civilian, and so things are looking a little rough over there, but that's what you get when your job is being bait. So now I've got my last two activations and we are going to go with Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus in an uncharacteristic show of selflessness is actually going to take two move actions and go and grab that civilian that Venom just dropped. We're gonna try and keep him safe from Ultron as long as we can. Finally, we have Iron Man who's sitting on a whole lot of power and would really love to unload a bunch of repulsor blasts and missile barrages into Ultron. But if I do that, he's just going to come back, and I don't think that puts me in a very good position. So Tony Stark has to stay focused on the mission, so I'm actually going to take a double move over to the console by Black Panther, and we're going to flip it back to our control because that's a victory point right there. So flipping that power console means that... Ultron only rolls three dice as opposed to four in this, his final activation of the round, but still it's a pretty significant set of results he gets from the dice. He gets secondary power reserves, which gives him another victory point and flips that console back under his control, which is going to net him another victory point at the end of the round. He also gets a better age. Because he is only going to target areas that have actually been searched that round, this means that since there's nothing within range 2 of the home base that has been searched, he's not going to destroy those. And because there's nothing within range 2 of where he is that's been searched, he's not going to destroy any of that. So then he's going to go and go for the thing that's been searched that is the largest, which is unfortunately is that really nice big under construction building that's been supplying me with a bunch of civilians. So he is going to go and destroy that. Now, at this point, I should have dropped a terrified civilian token, but I forget. I think it's okay because it really would have only been to my benefit to have one of those guys hanging around because that would have just been picked up by either Iron Man or Black Panther and I would have deposited it in my next turn and I would have basically gotten free victory points. As it is, because there's no civilian hanging around, this actually makes it a bit harder for me. 
So remember to drop civilian tokens when you when Ultron goes and blows up the scenery. So then Ultron is going to advance towards Dr. Octopus, who's standing right there with the terrified civilian that Ultron really, really wants. If Venom was up, I assume he would have done his Rage of Ultron attack, but because I think Venom basically doesn't count because he's dazed and can't be hurt, we're going to go with Metallic Talons plus Folly of Man, and again, he doesn't roll as well as I would expect him to, only causing two damage to the Doctor of the Octopi. So at the end of round two, Ultron is going to score another victory point for controlling one of the consoles. My team, the Avengers and friends, are going to score two for controlling two of the consoles, which is going to bring the final score up to seven to eight. It's getting pretty close to that victory point limit of 12 where the game ends. It's probably not going to go more than one more turn, and both teams are really, really close. So it's a new round and we're going to start with the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk isn't quite within range one of one of these shipping containers. So he is going to use Gamma Leap and just move a little bit to the blue one right over there. He's going to search it and he's going to find a civilian. Of course, what Hulk would really like to do is punch Ultron's head off, but he's just a little bit too far away. So instead, Bruce Banner is going to exert some control and we are going to focus on the objectives of saving lives. Next, we are going to play our first team tactic card of the game. Hulk is going to gamma launch Iron Man. I just want to move Iron Man over to that other shipping container so that when he takes a turn, he can search the container, hopefully find a civilian, and immediately deposit him into the home base. Hulk gets strategic. Finally, Hulk takes his short move, moves to the center towards that home base, and just drops the guy down the hole. So Dr. Octopus is finding himself in a little bit of a situation here. So he is going to take out his arm lasers, ideally the ones not holding the civilian, and open fire on Ultron, and we are going to do the job. Ultron only had one health remaining, and so we we're going to cause that one damage, get that one power, and blow up one of Ultron's bodies. Now Ultron does go and get a Corrupted Firmware token and then reappear next to one of his controlled Doomsday consoles, which puts him right next to Black Panther. Dr. Octopus then just advances, terrified civilian in tow, trying to get to that home base. Next, we're going to activate Iron Man. Iron Man is going to search that shipping container that's right next to him, and he's going to find a civilian as well. And we are in a nice situation where we have an action and power to burn, so we are going to fire a repulsor blast at Ultron with Friday AI. See if we can blast him away a little bit. Unfortunately, we don't get the wild to do the push. We also don't end up causing any damage to Ultron whatsoever, even with Ultron's kind of so-so energy defense of four. So Iron Man just has to content himself with flying to the center of the board, depositing the civilian, getting himself another victory point, and being a big hero. So it is Ultron's turn now, and he's rolling four dice for his Doomsday consoles. I believe he gets some pretty blah results on this one. I think he basically just ends up with one path to peace and horrifying scraping sounds. So unfortunately, Dr. Octopus has to drop the civilian that he's trying to truck over to safety. But other than that, nothing really bad happens. So now there's a civilian within five of Ultron. And I placed him over there specifically so that I can lure Ultron over in that direction. And so he's going to go towards him. And again, there's more than one person within two, but not more than one within range of his Rage of Ultron. Rage of Ultron does go up to range two if he's got three corrupted firmware tokens. He's only got one, so that doesn't take effect. So now he's going to go on to his energy blast. He's going to target the person with the lowest energy defense because no one's holding a civilian right now. And that, of course, is going to be the Hulk. This time he gets Hulk in his sights pretty well and causes a mighty five damage to the big green machine. Quick note there, I just saw my notes kind of out of order. Ultron did get secondary power reserve, so he did get plus one victory point, but since he was already controlling one of his doomsday consoles, he doesn't flip any additional ones. So he is creeping up closer towards that victory point total of 12. Anyway, on to the heroes. We're going to activate Captain America first, and there's a person that needs help, and Captain America is just the guy to help. So he's going to take two moves and then pick up that terrified civilian right next to Ultron. Spider-Man is going to activate next, and he's going to continue doing his civilian rescuing milk run. He is going to search that container, find a civilian, move to the home base, drop him off, and now he can do his second move action since he's no longer holding a civilian, and he's going to go over to that blue shipping container on the other side of the table this time since a bunch of my guys have moved away from it. So now it's Black Panther's turn, and what a turn it is. 
The first thing that he's going to do is spend one power and go and flip the console right next to him right back to our control. He's then going to move his long move over to that red shipping container getting set up for next round trying to rescue a civilian. But now he has a spare action and he is really close to Ultron so he is going to do a strike against Ultron which he rolls phenomenally for. Out of the blue those vibranium claws cause five damage to Ultron. Ultron doesn't like that at all. He says enough, goes and picks up Black Panther. I go check the chart to see where he throws him. He's going to throw him into the Hulk. Black Panther is going to take one damage from that throw. Hulk is going to take two. That was a pretty busy turn. But T'Challa is not done yet because now he has a bunch of power to play with. So he is going to use Pounce to jump away from Ultron, more specifically jump away from his friends, and then use Kinetic Burst, spending an extra power to get an extra die. Does four damage to Ultron. That is way more than this new body can handle. And another Ultron husk gets destroyed. You don't get to be king of Wakanda by being a slouch. But Ultron has a new body waiting in the wings which reappears next to the home base because he doesn't control any doomsday consoles right now. So this is Ultron's second activation of the round so we're going to roll three dice for his doomsday consoles. We are going to get secondary power reserves which just creeps that victory point total up a little bit more and takes control of the doomsday console between Dr. Octopus and Venom. He also activates the horrifying scraping sounds which are too much even for the steel nerves of Steve Rogers and Steve Rogers has to drop the civilian which ends up over in that same area. We want to get that far away from Ultron because I don't need him polishing that off this round. Unfortunately that does mean that Ultron is going to advance towards that dropped civilian and that puts him right between Dr. Octopus and Captain America and so he is finally going to use his Rage of Ultron attack. So nine dice come in at Captain America who uses his vibranium shield and takes zero damage because Captain America is an absolute champion. Unfortunately, Dr. Octopus is not made of the same kind of stern stuff. He is going to take three damage and get dazed. Ultron's rage was too much for the bad doc. So now's the time. Venom has to go and do some hero stuff. So first priority is to protect that civilian because we don't need Ultron getting more victory points. So Venom moves up and grabs the civilian. He still has power from those attacks that Ultron's been throwing at him. So he flips that console back to Avengers control. And he has an action to burn. So he is going to do symbiote tendrils on Ultron. Unfortunately, it doesn't cause any damage. It's Black Widow's turn and right now we need to restrict how many points Ultron can get at this which is probably going to be the last round of the game. So she is just going to take her long move, move over to the Doomsday console that no one has touched all game. Spider-Man was sitting by it for a while, never had the power to flip it. Anyway, she's finally going to put it into our control. That should get us across the finish line as far as victory points go, but it kind of depends on what Ultron can manage to do in his last activation. So it's Ultron's turn, his last activation of round three, and he is rolling his three dice for the Doomsday Consoles. He gets a pretty bad selection of them. Bad for me, not bad for the world-dominating robot. He gets secondary power reserves, which of course is going to give him another victory point, and also flip another console under his control, that one that was over by the under-construction building. It's not going to matter, I'm not going to be able to unflip it, so he's going to get another victory point for that. He also gets horrifying scraping sounds and as you know those symbiotes are vulnerable to sonic attacks and so Eddie Brock has to clutch his ears and the terrified civilian tries to escape behind him. But it's not far enough. Ultron has a medium move as well as flight so he easily hops over Venom to get within one of the civilian. He also launches a metallic talons attack on Venom as he goes, which causes a rather significant five points of damage, but that does give Venom a bunch of power to respond. So he's going to activate his reaction of so many snacks plus we are Venom, and he's going to cause a pretty respectable four damage back at the big metal machine. So that heals Venom back up four damage, so now he's only down one, but Ultron did not care for that at all, so he uses enough, grabs Venom, and smashes him into the dumpster nearby. Venom is size three, the dumpster is size two, so the dumpster just gets flattened to a pulp, and Venom takes an extra one point of damage. And of course, casually, Ultron just smushes the poor civilian trying to make for the table edge. 
That gives Ultron another victory point. He's also going to get a victory point for that console that he's controlling at the end of the round. Fortunately, my guys are controlling three of them, so that brings the final score of the game. Ultron manages to get to the goal of 12 victory points, but the Avengers hurdle past it with 14. That means my guys have won. So, Marvel Crisis Protocol, All is Metal, Ultimate Encounter, Solo Play. This one was grueling. Like I said, it took me two restarts to get going on this game, and then even so, it took me about four hours to play through this. Most of that was just checking things. Now, obviously, I'm also taking pictures and that kind of thing for the battle reports, taking notes. But even so, the rules for this game and for the scenario are spread out all over. There was a lot of flipping back and forth because some rules for interacting with objectives are in one place and some rules are in another place and some are in a third place. Some rules for the scenario are in the special encounter section of the rules. Some are in the specifics for the all is metal rulebook. And then a lot of them are actually on these little cards that you hand out. So they're not in either of those other books. You've got to look at these little cards that the players get. And of course, I'm playing both sides. So I've got all these cards. So I'm constantly looking through all these different sources to find out how this game works. Not to mention, of course, the cards themselves and all the characters, which have all of their particular rules, many of which interact with each other. This is actually a little bit easier because Ultron doesn't cause quite so many reactions and dice modifications for people around him. But even so, there's these reactions with the throws and the team tactics cards, which I honestly didn't get to use a whole lot. If you are playing this game yourself, really consider which characters you're using. I found that the characters with long movements were extremely useful for trying to get back and forth from the home base with civilians. Also, Hulk is really good during this. He can eat up a lot of damage. You don't want to get one of your characters dazed to miss out on his activation. And of course, Hulk never gets dazed and loves taking damage from Ultron from the various barrages and small attacks that he does here and there. Also, he generates that three power around, which is really handy. It means he can search and also maybe Gamma Leap if Cap's on his team, or he can search and flip a console or something like that. Things that the other characters really struggled to do because they weren't near any enemies to generate power from attacks. And also, just Ultron has high defenses. So if you're counting on doing damage to generate your power, like Cabal with Red Skull or anything like that, you might be hard-pressed. Captain America's power was useful, his affiliation advantage, but honestly, you're spending most of your power on searching and picking up objectives and flipping consoles, so you're not spending a lot of power on superpowers anyway. I think you absolutely could play this at a harder difficulty level if you knew the game better than I did and maybe had a more refined team. I mean, one of my teams didn't even have an affiliation, so that probably didn't help. If you knew your team tactics cards more, and obviously I didn't, again, I was power starved, so there wasn't a lot of options for me to use them in the first place. I probably should have used mission objective to hold on to one of those civilians. Dr. Octopus had some power hanging around. He could have done that at one of those times. I think the scenario played okay, but it's difficult. I think using the Marvel Universe miniature models worked just fine. Everything's kind of clustered in the middle. You don't really hurt for movement. I felt like my characters could get wherever they needed to go in most circumstances. I thought that worked out just fine. I do hope you enjoyed seeing it. If I made some mistakes or you have some observations about the game or comments or anything like that, please put them below. Otherwise, thanks for watching. I will see you on the next one.